What's going on, guys? This is Tech Habit Weekly, episode 17 for February 5th, 2014. This is the show where me and Mr. Dante, uh, we like to talk tech. It's our habit. We give into it. We try to once a week. Uh, we do apologize for missing last week, but you know, real life just happens being you know college students who have jobs and life is busy. So we do apologize for that, but we are back this week. And uh, I'm looking at the show notes here. I think we have a lot of stories to make up for it. Uh, we tend to focus, I guess, specifically on Apple. Uh, I, I guess I shouldn't say you know, exclusively or anything, but uh, we kind of have that slight little Apple bias. But today we have a whole mix of stuff. We have stuff about Microsoft, uh, Facebook. Of course, we do have some Apple stuff in there. So we do have a pretty gem-packed show for you to try to make up for last week. So with that said, we're just going to go ahead and dive right into it. Uh, our first uh, story here. Good thing I brought my swimsuit uh, about Facebook paper being released. Now, Dante, what exactly is Facebook paper? Uh, for those of you who don't know what Facebook paper is, basically, if any of you guys are familiar with maybe like Google's newsstand or maybe apps like Flipboard, it's pretty much a full interface that's really, really clean and intuitive to give you the full experience of a an actual like news reading um, app. You know, so it's really good for reading like tech articles and things like that. But Facebook wanted this particular app to be exclusively, you know, not so much like the Facebook poke app. We remember how bad that app was. And um, this is going to be something that people can use on a daily basis. And they'll add different sections and different uh, likes of uh, interests like say technology and you know, sports and cars and things like that into their interests of find different articles that they can um, click on. And honestly, I have it and it's actually a pretty nice interface on it. It's really clean. It, uh, let's see if you guys can see there. Now it's loading. Just a second. <laughs> but really nice. See, I like UFC uh, fighting and whatnot and a couple other people that are on my feed like it. And, you know, there's just different things with your events. And it still does some of your Facebook events and things, too. But you can also go here and get to some of the different articles that we have here. And it works really well just by swiping. Everything's done by swiping. And it's a full, like I said, full interface to this app. So there's nothing that's going to just get in the way and just do things that you don't want it to do. And it's really, really nice. It's really clean. It's really snappy and fast. But here's the thing, though. Uh, one of the things about this app is I have the Flipboard app already, and I like the Flipboard app. I don't use it as much as I did because I use it mostly on my iPad where it's awesome on the iPad. But with Facebook's paper app in a mobile version of it, sometimes it's like, eh, I think this is more something that's more geared towards something on a bigger platform. I don't yeah. know about you, Bob. Are you using something like this? Because, you know, if you're not... I think you should at least give it a try, but just from me going from two different platforms, I actually like it better on the larger architecture. Yeah, I've, I've used Flipboard in the past. Um, I'm kind of like you. I don't use it right now as much as I used to, and I think that's due to just the fact that you know I'm usually here on my desktop, and I can literally just tilt my head to the left, and I have my Twitter feed there at all times, and so I always have – like that's where I usually find out about things first. Uh, really the times I use Flipboard is if I'm you know somewhere waiting for something, like if I'm out waiting for like an, a, doc a doctor's appointment or something, then I'll be like, all right, what's happening on Flipboard? And it is fun to swipe through the user interface. Now um, with Facebook, I'm not a Facebook user. I think I'm one of the very, very few that – where is it here? On my iPhone? Facebook is not to be found on here. I don't even have the Facebook app installed. And so I'm just one of those few people that don't even use Facebook at all. Uh, there's just, on, in my opinion, there's just too many people posting way too much that I don't care about. <laughs> I like Twitter because there's 140 characters. If there's a link in there, there's a link in there. And, you know, it's, it's really simple. Uh, with that said, this app, this whole Facebook paper app, looks good enough that I'm actually considering installing it and giving it a go, despite my, I would say, dislike of Facebook. And so that says a lot. I mean, I like I said, I haven't personally used Face yet, but I have seen people using it online. I was watching MacBreak Weekly just yesterday, and they they gave like a little quick demo on an iPad Mini, and that looked really nice. The whole user interface, like Dante said, is based off of swiping. It looks extremely modern, and um, from what they said on Twit or more specifically Mac Break Weekly, uh, it kind of gives you tutorials as you go along. So it's not just one splash page up front that you know says, this is how you use the app. Once it's done, then you have to hunt to find that screen again. As you, you know, you might not know that you can swipe all these stories, but it'll tell you that. And then it'll, it'll like teach you how to use the app app as you that's uh dante what what do you think of you know just the interface in and of itself is there anything that gives it an edge over flipboard um 
Edge, I can't say anything as far as the initial usage of it and things that I've noticed. Maybe there's some things that maybe to the untrained eye that maybe be underlining that you can see only because I had Flipboard first. So the swiping of pages and the full UI experience is something I'm used to from Flipboard. So I feel like I don't want to say it's a copycat, but it's definitely borrowing a lot of the concepts from Flipboard and those apps that take over the full features of the UI of your phone that makes it honestly feel like you are flipping through a pamphlet instead of you know using a, a mobile device so um i can't really say anything only sometimes some of the text um colors don't really go with the picture like sometimes there's you know a really bright uh picture and the text is white so sometimes in between like uh -huh. say some sun rays and glares and things it's harder to see and i don't know if that's more of on you know the developer or whoever um will come up the articles in i'm not quite sure but that's some of the things that were a little harder on the eyes uh, for myself and then of course the learning curve there's going to be a learning curve because there's different gestures of swiping maybe up and down left yeah. and right you know different things like that but we all know that once you get used to that everything's uh you know will go just as smooth as butter but you know with and that that's being the world said, we live in now with all these touch devices <laughs> yes basically but you know, with that being said, you know, it is it's a it's a very, very, very good app, I feel, in just right out of the box and you know, installing it. I felt like I navigated through it pretty well and I think that anyone else would do it just fine. And some people maybe even go as far as replacing their Facebook app with the paper app. Um Terrell actually mentioned that to me that he was thinking about doing the same thing. And and you know, that's pretty good because that lets people know that, you know, you don't have to be stuck on you know trying to read small text and you know trying to see what this is and have videos playing automatically and things like that those are some of the issues that i have with the facebook app but um paper app for facebook i think is pretty good i mean you guys yeah. let us know down in the comments what do you guys think that whole thing that you just talked about it makes me wonder why they didn't just combine it all into one app anyway where you know when you first launch facebook you know it up makes an update or something and it says hey we have a new look would you like to try it and throughout your time using the app you could just switch from the classic interface to the paper interface i think that would have been a better way to go rather than making people you know install a whole separate application because this right. way you know if the facebook app you know has an update and then that can get updated, but then the Facebook paper app has its own update. I think it it just gets kind of confusing to people. Yeah. Uh, so I do you think that they might merge this together in the future, or do you think that you know they made it two apps for a reason? I think they made it two apps for a reason, only because you know um, Facebook it targets a lot of different users from various and vast age groups. I mean, there's even a poll that shows that more um, people that are older in age are using Facebook opposed to Twitter and, you know, Google yeah. Plus and things like that. So it make it makes sense. And um, to keep it separate is probably to help not culture shock some of the older users or people that, you know, who just don't like change very much. And they go, oh, wait a minute, what's going on? Where's, where's all my man? I can't see who poked me, you know, and things like that. So um, you don't want to shock, you don't want to give too much shock value to those uh, customers. Uh, that are like that, you know, because you don't want to lose uh, users on that particular app by doing something so drastic. But I think the real tech enthusiast and a person that actually likes like a newsstand type of app would really love this app from Facebook. And I think they should keep it separate for that reason. Because guess what? Just and then if it tanks, the whole app didn't tank. It was just that. That's separate true. App. So, that's a good point. So I think that's a, I think that's just a fail safe. And if they merge, they would have to be very strong willed about that to be to do that. But I do like the idea like you said like almost like say with an android like a launcher or something that you can have different styles of well mine looks like this where if you want you can switch it to look like that you know to the uh, paper uh, side to it or do you want it to look like the regular ui that facebook has normally had but you know that that's that's a very good idea but you know i, I see it doing pretty well maybe not stacking up against uh some of the other uh competitors that it has in that category but with time and you know new innovations we'll see how things progress and maybe it's going to push out for some some of those apps like newsstand and flipboard to probably up the ante because now there's a little more competition around the block and especially some competition that a lot of people are currently using with the facebook app so we'll definitely keep an eye on this uh, article as it progresses and see what happens but you guys leave us a comment down in the uh, youtube chat there and let us know what do you guys think and what's going to happen with this? Will this be a global phenomenon, or do you think it's just kind of a one-trick pony and be out and within a, a year or so? 
Yeah, like Dante said, said it perfectly. Let us know down below in the comments what you think. And with that, we're going to segue right into our next story, which is also about Facebook. Uh, Facebook celebrates 10 years, which honestly kind of makes me feel a bit old because uh, it seems you know, not that long ago that you know Facebook was coming out and people were hopping on that train. But uh, in, in order to celebrate this 10-year, uh, base, uh, Facebook is giving users a look back. And basically what this is, is Facebook is it basically just, you know, creates what it, I guess your top moments uh, from way back, you know, your first couple moments on Facebook, the first couple you posted, the most popular things that you've posted, the, the post with the most likes, things like that. Uh, Dante, I, I see uh, here that you made one. Uh, what was that like? Was it all done for you? Did you have any kind of input with that? Um, I had no input with it. It was very simple. You click the link and I believe that Facebook just compiles it on a number of statistics. Um, they pretty much base it on, you know, maybe how many likes a photo has or, you know, maybe when you joined and things like that. And I joined back in 2008, but I think I can't remember really how much I really even use it. Um, I use it pretty, uh, pretty well now. Um, but it just compiles all your moments and different pictures and things that have happened. And it's kind of cool because, you know, there's pictures I forgot about, you know, there's things that are just in my, you know, Facebook photo uh, library that I'm just like, oh, I forgot about that. That was a long time ago. So it was kind of cool to see what happened in between 2000 eight to now and um, Terrell our uh, producer he's gonna get ready to show uh, one example of one of those are and it's actually gonna be my personal one so I think it's kind of nice I mean for their um, 10 year to celebrate the 10 year that they just give a look back on all their users and anyone once they click it they can get into their own it'll and you can have the choice to either just view it for your own personal uh, use and just kind of like okay cool and or you can share it I chose to share mine just to get it out there and kind of see because a lot of people have been posting these and you know um, it is one generic template every single video is about a minute and four seconds long and it goes through the same basic thing it's just every everyone's little event will be a little different because there's gonna be different um, photos and things like that like there's a picture of me on there with, you know with all my monitors and everything set up and I was just uh, working and it's kind of cool because it shows some different like dual monitor setups and some some things that I had and you know you can tell how much of a nerd I am there's like pictures of ebooks and covers and things like that that come across my um, my timeline so yeah I, I think it's pretty cool and you know just just something that they did a little extra for the Facebook audience I think worked out and it's just nice because it's something short and sweet and doesn't take too much effort and it's not like oh you know hey you have to make this they compiled it for you um, you know under some statistics and just made it for you and just there you go everyone's the same so you can't say oh well his was better than mine or they gave him you know this guy different music or anything so hey, I thought it was pretty nice I mean just for the 10 year it's good to go I like it yeah, it'd, it'd be a, a fun look back, I guess, on you know what you've posted. And I'm sure people that post stuff that they shouldn't, they're probably like, uh... Yeah. <laughs> that might Luckily, be kind I of wasn't one of those guys. I, I wasn't <laughs> nervous uh, about putting it on there or anything. You know, I was just like, yeah, we'll see what happens. You know, the only weird thing that probably was on there was when I made some, like, bacon wrap uh, burgers on the grill. <laughs> that was, I was like, that was weird, but I guess I got a lot of likes on that picture. But, there you go. No big deal. But, yeah, so... But yeah, be careful. Be be aware. Of some of you guys that you know, you know, probably have some pictures of some different inappropriate things. <laughs> Depending on how many likes you got, <laughs> might pop up. So <laughs> be careful out there. But yeah, yeah, let us know what you guys think about this in the comments below. Uh, if you are an avid Facebook user, is this something that you thought was really fun, or did you can just not bother to click it? Whatever the case is, be sure to let us know down below. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get off the Facebook train and we're going to hop on the Microsoft one now. Uh, recently, Steve Ballmer, he called it quits. So now Microsoft finally, after a little bit of searching, has a new, new CEO by the name of Satya Nadella. So uh, Dante, go ahead and tell us a little bit about him. It looks like here uh, he was uh, the cloud and enterprise head at Microsoft. So, I mean, is there anything else about him that kind of stands out from what Ballmer was? Well, I mean, this guy is a, definitely a veteran. I thought that was pretty nice that Microsoft chose to go with someone who has some quote unquote mileage in the gas tank. And um, this is a guy he's been around since 1991, so he's a 22 year veteran at Microsoft. Um, another fun fact he's only the third CEO um, in the history, of yeah. course, with Bill Gates being the first, Steve Ballmer, and now Nadella. And um, now Bill Gates is going to actually take over the role uh, over uh, tech, technology advisor. So, um, 
from the press conference and some statements that uh, Bill Gates have had, he said he feels very strongly about Nadella being able to take over the reins at Microsoft, and he feels that he is a leader among his peers and is very well liked by many people in the Microsoft Corporation. So we're definitely going to see some changes here. You know, I want to see kind of the innovation that he wants to bring, and I'm sure there's a lot of things, but with him having a background in engineering, some things that maybe be able to push Microsoft into forefront because they've had kind of some, you know, troubling Struggles. times lately, you know, especially with the advances of technology, you would think that Microsoft would be on top of pretty much every category, especially in the operating system category, but they have really taken a pretty bad hit with the Windows 8 adaptation into their line, and um, I don't know about you, Bob, but do you run Windows 8 as a primary OS? As a primary OS, not at all. Uh, I have it in parallels on, on OS X just to mess around with. I have it on both my main machine here and my MacBook sitting back here. It's fun to mess around with, but you know, clicking through it and installing a few things, it's not something I'd want to use on a daily basis. I'm very happy with my OS X here. So uh, it's like you say, I mean, Microsoft really hasn't been doing their best lately. The Windows 8, you know, 7 to 8, really rough transition. And actually, this past quarter, uh, they sold more, like the copies of Windows 7 sold actually increased from where it has been. So that says wow. something as to the situation that, you know, Microsoft is currently in. And so a new CEO could bring a whole, you know, a different, I guess, uh, perspective onto what maybe Windows 8.1, if, you know, they make like an 8.2 or even like in the future Windows 9, he could bring a new, a new perspective onto what we see next. And, um, you know, maybe he'll split the operating systems up into two different things. They'll have maybe say Windows, you know, touch and then Windows desktop or something. And so we'll get a little bit into this uh, later, but there's actually some news uh, regarding Apple and their mobile versus their desktop operating systems too. So uh, maybe Microsoft will take more of an approach kind of like that. Uh, but as in terms of the new CEO, uh, do you think it was a good move that Ballmer uh, just finally just stepped down? I mean, because you can't really think of Steve Ballmer without hearing the words developer, developers like a thousand times. He was kind yeah. of out there. So do you think it's good that he stepped down and that we're getting a new breath of fresh air or was it a little I bit too soon? <laughs> Honestly, I think it was good, and honestly, I think it took a little longer than expected because you got to realize Ballmer stepped down five months ago, and with having the new collaboration of Nadella coming into the corporation as the head of the corporation as a CEO, you got to realize that this guy, he's a, you know, he's a pretty seasoned guy. Uh, some of the things that he accomplished at, while being in office um, at Microsoft was one was he transformed Windows Live into Bing. So I thought that that was pretty cool. And maybe he sees things maybe from more of a consumer, um, you know, respective instead of just, you know, such a big enterprise market. You know, I know those things are very important, too. But you have to realize, too, Bob, that no one in this world, corporation, corporate rise, enterprise wise, would put Windows 8 on any of their <laughs> devices only because of how it works. It is very integrated for touch and technology. I understand what Microsoft was trying to do. It was a very smart business you know, proposition to put one thing that spanned across the globe. That way, like say for instance at Apple, you don't have iOS developers and OS 10 developers and things like that, but it it really struggles when you try to throw that across every platform because you have in to think of every works, single thing. In theory it works, but in practice it doesn't. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, hopefully putting him here will kind of, you know, you know, kind of iron out some of those wrinkles that are in Microsoft right now because, of course, they're going to own the market because they are a, a primarily a software developing company. And, of course, you can sell more software than you can hardware to attach to it. But we'll have such a nosedive that Windows 8 did almost put me back to like the Windows um, 2000, Windows ME days. And, you know, where Microsoft felt, you know, at that point, it was like, you guys can't innovate, you know. And we all know about the debacle that Windows Vista was before Windows 7. And like you said before, more they've sold more copies of Windows 7 on quote unquote Windows 8 laptops being basically backwards compatible, you know, basically with um, in legacy mode. You can do that. I don't know if you guys know that, but in your laptops, if you have Windows 8, you know, you can go into legacy mode to install the older operating system. If you try to do a standard, it would say, hey, your software is already newer than this particular timestamp. Yeah. So they've sold more 
that way than they have on the newest thing. Now, we all know that newer uh, usually is better. Well, in this particular case, not so much. There's a huge learning curve. The Metro interface, a lot of people have had a, a lot of problems with. And like you said, I have one just for personal use. That way, I'm just not so foreign to Windows 8. And, you know, because I actually get a lot of customers that have Windows 8 laptops I have to fix. Well, if I can't navigate through Windows 8, then that's a problem for my customers yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So, but I think, you know, I think this will be good. I don't think it can do any bad right now because I think Microsoft right now needs some innovation, some, you know, a new mind, you know, and kind of someone at the reins to just say, hey, I've been here long enough. I've seen what happens. I know the problems and now I can do something about it. So we'll definitely see what happens in the uh, upcoming months and, and see what happens as, you know, Nadella actually gets settled into his new role at Microsoft. Yeah, so uh, I say to him, you know, thumbs up, c congrats on the job. Now get to fixing stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I say. Start so, with Skype. Uh, what do you guys think? <laughs> yep, exactly. Fix Skype, please. <laughs> so, what do you guys think? Uh, was this a good move on Microsoft's part? Uh, did it take longer than you thought? Was Bomber uh, the better match? Whatever you guys feel about this, let us know down below in the comments. Now, what we're going to do is uh, move to an inch more of an interesting story. Uh, and this is regarding the Super Bowl. Uh, not a great game. Uh, whether I mean, wh whichever side you were on, if you're a Seahawks fan, hey, you won, but it wasn't even uh, it wasn't even fun by the end of it. <laughs> it was kind of painful. <laughs> but regardless, uh, this is talking about uh, streaming the Super Bowl. Now, I personally didn't stream the Super Bowl. I just watched it live. But uh, from what I understand, Dante, you actually did stream the Super Bowl. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, how how was this quality? How was there ads? You know, how did it go? Honestly. There was times while streaming the Super Bowl, I forgot I was streaming the Super Bowl. It was that <laughs> great of quality. And, of course, you know, having a nice ISP connection works pretty well, Helps. too. But, you know, uh, I pretty much I logged in. Um, I just typed into the address bar. I went to foxsports.com, and right there they had a live streaming of the uh, Super Bowl. I caught it about three or four minutes into the game and streamed it the entire time seamlessly with no problems. And there's some interesting facts here. It says there's an average of uh, 528,000 per minute were streaming this year compared to last year of 508,000. Now, you guys might think that eh, that's not that big of a bump, and it really is. It percentage-wise, it's only a 4% increase from last year uh, to this year. But with the people streaming about 25% longer than the average, the average was about 48 minutes longer than last year. And some of the peak views were up upwards to 1.1 million at one time in the third quarter. Quarter. And like you said, Bob, the game was horrible. I've seen. I, I didn't know if this was just a professional pickup game or what, but it was atrocious. I mean, it was a complete blowout. I feel sorry for yeah. anyone that was on the Broncos fans. There was guys <laughs> driving Ford Broncos that were upset. And, I mean, it was terrible. Every position the Seahawks could score from, they pretty much scored from. If they had a two-point conversion, so many turnovers. that would have been everything. Yeah, the turnovers were ridiculous. I didn't know if the thing was – if the football was made of molten lava because apparently the Broncos couldn't handle it. Every time they touched it, they wanted to give it, get it and let it go. So <laughs> we're still investigating that too as well, right? I don't know if the ball was fixed. We're going to find serious. that out next, next episode of Tech Habit Weekly. But let's go back to the game. It was, I mean, there was it wasn't even close. There wasn't even a game. There wasn't any competition. It was just a complete thrashing out there. Yeah. Super and Bowls are more fun when both teams show up. Definitely. And I'm not a sports fan, really. So don't, so guys don't, you know, I don't want any fanboys, you know, yeah. oh, you know, <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs didn't do anything. You're darn right. And they probably won't do anything next year. But, um, you know, like I said, I'm not a good, big sports guy. I mostly watch the Super Bowl for the ads, but being able to stream it, and I streamed it right here on this 2009 MacBook, and I streamed it to my 27 inch um, Samsung uh, t television through the mini display port to HDMI port, and it worked perfectly. And like I said, I almost forgot I was actually streaming it because it was that good. So it was nice. I mean, you know, you guys um, on the podcast here, had, did you guys stream the Super Bowl or did you know that you could stream the Super Bowl? Um, if so, or if you just don't care, whatever. But <laughs> leave us a comment below. I mean, I think these are some pretty impressive numbers um, as far as streaming because, I mean, that's the most watched, like, you know, streaming sports sporting event ever, you know, yeah. and <laughs> of the year. Yeah. And so that's that's nice. I mean, that, that's that's a good accolade by itself. And I think it's good. So. I like yeah. so you know yeah I like it I mean streaming is yeah, always more, good uh, you know? 
One more interesting uh, statistic here. Uh, it actually required a 1.5 gigabit per second connection to be able to, to stream it like that. So that's faster than Google Fiber at its max. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think about that. That's absolutely insane. It I don't know why we can't have that in our houses. Seamless. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's insane. But those are just some fun facts about you know the, the streaming of the Super Bowl. And if it was this smooth next year, then I don't see why next year these numbers won't increase more. Uh, because you know I didn't even really think about streaming the Super Bowl. I mean, I knew I could do it, but I was comfy on the couch, and there's just you know a TV right there. So, uh, but maybe next year, because this year I knew it worked so good. You know, next year I might say, hey, I'll give this sh this a shot, and you know, have it up on a monitor over here, and continue my work on the other monitors. So, right. uh, be and sure to I'm, let us know what you guys think. Oh, go ahead. And then one another fun fact about next year's Super Bowl, Bob, that I know you're going to really like, is that for the Super Bowl halftime show, they're going to actually have Hannah Montana and Miley Cyrus there. So <laughs> yes. you definitely want to scream that, <laughs> capture card it, scream capture, I full will. stream. It's going to be great. Well, actually, we'll no. have it up here. I'll just, I'll just buy a ticket. <laughs> Like I'll yeah, go, just and go be there. there. <laughs> just go there live, you know, tongue out and yeah. everything. <laughs> like, I'll just hop on stage. I'll get thrown out by security. I don't care. I don't care but I'll get Miley. <laughs> regardless if we didn't lose any of our viewers uh, we're going to move on to our next story and by the way tell us what you think about that in the comments uh, we're going to move on to our next story about some Apple stuff and some iCloud stuff more in, in particular and that's iCloud bookmarks coming soon now Dante do you use the web interface for iCloud at all or do you just use you know mail through your mail client reminders through reminders app do you use the web app at all web app Pretty much never. I've used it. I probably can count them on one hand. Um, and it's just not my cup of tea. You know, I've used it before, you know, when they were doing the, you know, I work through the iCloud and things like that. I just want to see some of the interfaces, you know, that they had and some of the things that they offered in the beta stages. But other than that, no, I personally don't. But what they have here, they say is basically iCloud.com glitch suggests that iCloud bookmarks viewer are coming soon to the website. Now, I don't know if a lot of you guys do have a Mac, but there is an iCloud button that you can look at that's usually closest to your forward and uh, back button um, on your browser uh, in Safari. So you click that on the iCloud tabs and mine actually says iPhone 5S and it shows what tabs I have open on all my devices, my iPad and iPhone, MacBook, like every, everything's there. And it's kind of nice because sometimes you forget, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, what website was that? And then I'm like, I was on the MacBook and then I mean, oh, the tab is still open. Then you click that and I can bring the tab on my desktop. So it's really nice. But here's the thing. Uh, what they're talking about here is, like you said, the web interface. And I'm not too sure what this is. A lot of people, there were speculation saying that this could just be, you know, and like a bookmark extension. But I think that's kind of weird because Apple uh, bookmark, uh, I mean, this extensions have already been out for several months now. And it says that um, it's already been integrated into Chrome and Firefox. So I'm not quite sure what this is, you know, 100%. And honestly, I don't think this is something that I personally would even really care, care about, you know, only because See, I, don't uh, I, I think um – I do actually use the web app only on one occasion, and that's when I'm at school, say, on a Windows computer, and I need to get something for my email. Then I can just go to iCloud.com, log in, access my inbox through that, and then I can download that attachment or do whatever have you. And I think what this is going to be is if you go to the web interface, you have you know a mail icon, find my iPhone icon, stuff like that. I think there's actually going to be like a little bookmark icon there so that I can say, oh, I have this bookmarked on my Mac at home. And so I could I can go to iCloud.com and have access to all those bookmarks even on a Windows based computer at school or at work or anything like that. So I think that's you know the use case that they're going for here. It's not for everybody. I, like you said, you never really use the web app, so it doesn't really fit right. into your lifestyle very much. Then so, also ha owning an actual Mac too that that yeah. kind of trumps that too. But like you said, <laughs> just because you know think of how many. Um, iPhone users actually don't own a Mac. I mean, you don't have to have a Mac to own wow. an iPhone, and you still have an iCloud email address that you can use, and like you said, to access it through the web app. It makes perfect sense, but a person like me, nah, I'll just use the built-in mail app that I already have. I don't have to log in. It's just it's open as soon as I click it. You add it one time. It's good to go. But for a lot of people that are Windows users or maybe can't get to their personal computers or you know something maybe there's a VPN problem networking you know things like that um that is a very good way to do that so that's that's yeah. nice you know but honestly yeah. for me probably not <laughs> yeah the, really the only other thing i use the web app for is every once in a while i'll kind of lose my phone around the house somewhere but like, where did i put my phone is it like in a couch cushion or something 
then I could just fire up iCloud.com, click find my phone, and then have it play the noise. And so that can save me some time too. So I do actually use the web app on occasion. Uh, but like you said, it's only the, those few certain things. If I'm at school and need an attachment right then and I can't use my MacBook to do that, or if you know, like I want to launch find my iPhone or something, so I could see myself maybe using this, you know, when it eventually comes to fruition. Uh, but but for you know, it's gonna be like a big deal. It's not gonna make me use the web interface that much more. It'll just be there if I ever actually do need it. So is this does this excite you guys? You know, does this make you want to run out and go to visit the web app? <laughs> be sure to let us know down below in the comments. Uh, also on the train of Apple, we're going to skip to some Apple TV news. The Apple TV has basically officially, well I guess that kind of contradicts basically officially, we're going to go with officially <laughs> for this one, officially graduates from being a hobby to Apple to actually having its own product line. Now Dante, what exactly do we mean by that? Well basically this is the first time that I feel that Apple is really putting any real effort into the Apple TV, which is kind of weird because we're already on the third generation currently of the Apple TV. So with that being said, it's kind of weird that it's almost, you know, to me, it, it felt like it was the redheaded stepchild of Apple's products. <laughs> you know, I really like the Apple TV. I use it every single day it's really nice and um now there's actually a, a section in the uh, app store where you can actually go and check out some different components and you know um cabling and just things like that for your apple tv you know yeah accessories basically and um i think it's pretty nice but we actually have something down here uh, further in the article that both some things that there's speculation that apple is going to uh, include on the next generation apple tv that's going to include an airport express into one conjoined unit and it's going to include an 802.11 AC uh, router in, in it and that would be awesome. I kind of bridge that gap in between, you know, having, say your ISP is going to more likely have like an 802.11 N router or G, you know, router more than likely G and being able to incorporate that into your Apple TV and already have basically like a router already built into it. That would be awesome because if they had a USB port and everything on the back of it, you can make cloud stores with USB um, attached devices, you know, uh, network printers, things like that just by, and it doesn't have to be a network printer. You just plug it in USB. Um, another thing that they were saying, it was like they were trying to put everything basically into one box. They were even saying uh, speculation about having a built-in TV tuner because pretty much everyone does that anyway. A lot of people have bundled uh, television, phone, and internet service all ready together. So why not Apple? And then also they said that uh, – it would probably more than likely support 4K uh, televisions and be more have a more emphasis on gaming. You can use your already existing iTouch devices such as your iPhone, your iPod touches, and iPads to control the uh, UI interface uh, with the remote app and be able to use it as a game controller. And it says that there's a lot of in uh, innovation and things that are coming out in the upcoming 2014 uh, season through Tim Cook. And every single one of these specs and bullet points are something I am definitely waiting for. It's the reason why I'm not buying another Apple TV right now. You know, I'm like itching to buy one right now. And I actually had to buy a mini display port to HDMI port for my MacBook just to put it in another room to avoid <laughs> buying another Apple TV for that particular reason. Every single one of these things would be awesome uh, for a person like me that actually uses the Apple TV. So what do you think, Bob? Because uh, do you have an Apple TV? I do have an Apple TV and I use it every day. Yeah. <laughs> I love my Apple TV. Uh, it, it really is great for what I want to do with it. Uh, the one thing I don't like about the current Apple TV is that so like if I want to say for example on my iPhone or my iPad or something, I want to play a game and air, air play that game, there's a huge like latency in that. And I don't know if that's network related, which I don't think so. Uh, I have a, you know, a wireless end router, the whole nine yards. Uh, so I think it just has something to do with the processing on the Apple TV's part. So if we are going to see you know an updated Apple TV, uh, which by the way, having an Airport Express built into it would absolutely be awesome <laughs> first yeah. off but they're also probably gonna you know bump up the processor and things like that so uh, that even though I do have a perfectly fine working Apple TV if this is everything that this article is saying it's gonna be then I'd probably run out and buy another one just because I mean it would just oh, yeah. be worth it and uh, really it comes down to I guess what the price would be because <laughs> we are getting in this package a lot more than what we have with just the hockey puck I mean this is you know basically like a router 
and an Apple TV combined into one, which like you said, if it has a USB port on it, you could use that for network devices. Uh, you know, there's a lot, this is a lot more versatile than what we currently have. So I wouldn't expect the price to increase. So uh, Dante, if you were to say, if you were to you know, walk into a store or see it on the Apple store, what price do you think that you'd buy it for? Okay, well, uh, this is going to be pretty simple, Bob. I'm going to just base this off the current prices of the current uh, third generation Apple TV and the current generation of the Airport Express. They're both linked at $99 right now. I think that if uh, Apple can hit us in the middle somewhere, maybe $149.99 would probably be a really good price. You know, and of course, lower would be better, but you have to realize how how much more you know beef you're actually getting on that steak, yeah. and you know you can't go from something that only does one basic main feature to a wide range of features because of course with the new uh, 802.11 AC uh, architecture that's being built in, I'm sure that's going to be built into it anyway even if they plan on doing it separately but it would be very nice to have all of that into one central Absolutely. location <laughs> and honestly where my router sits, I mean literally the Apple TV's here, the router's like right here. So and I actually Why have not my Apple them? TV <laughs> exactly, and my Apple TV is actually hardwired, you know, to the router. So why not? You know, that matter of fact, that like I said, that would be better. I mean, a lot better. Like I said, for you know, USB storage or you know, turning a standard USB printer into a networkable printer, you know, that would be very nice. And hopefully, if they hit us at the right price point, it'd be nice. I hope it's not so far out of the ballpark, like one ninety nine, ninety nine. You know, that would you know make me go uh, a little bit. But then we'd have to see the features and, like you said, the latency on the AirPlay. I have the same issue too, especially with the iPhone five S. And I don't know if it's because of sixty four bit architecture and playing some of these higher end games, but the games that I play. Um, yeah, it takes up, you know, running yeah. a lot, a lot of frames, and it glitches crazy. I mean, it's just chip, 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 you know, when you're actually playing it on the uh, airplane on the Apple TV. But anything else that the airplay, I mean, I can air flick and boom, and it's right there on the oh, TV, yeah. and it's yep. perfect. I mean, even bringing my whole phone's display and like maybe even bring, opening the camera app and everything, everything's like perfect on there besides the gaming. So if they work on that area, they may have a real nice competition. It's just good to give uh, your consumers a little extra like that to just, you know, play around with. And, you yeah. know, but I don't know. That's yet to be seen. I don't know if they'll go to, you know, it being combined. I could see it because, I mean, the Airport Express, it's pretty much, it looks just like the Apple TV currently. It's just white. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and taller, yeah. So, um, but we'll see. But I don't know what's going to happen with the Airport Extreme line because, you know, they do have the Airport Extreme and Airport Express. So I don't know if they're just going to do Apple TV plus Airport ex uh, Express and then the Airport Extreme. I'm not sure, you know. I think that's what they would do. I mean, if you buy an Airport Extreme, you, you probably expect a few more features like that. And if you expect that, you want to probably just want to have a dedicated router. Then I, I, I would think the Airport Express in conjunction with an Apple TV is a much more consumer, I don't, consumer, I don't want to mess with it device. So I would think, you know, if for power users that want the the airport extreme uh, instead of the express then they'll probably just want that dedicated unit for that but um, also uh, really quick just to get back to the processing i think currently uh, the apple tv has i think an a4 chip in it which is you know from like the iphone 4 and 4s i believe uh, but i mean even i bet if they threw an a7 in there from the uh, the iphone 5s we'd probably see that latency go away that's yeah. <laughs> that, that's just yeah. my guess <laughs> definitely. definitely so yeah uh, be sure to let us know what you guys think down below in the comments Comments, would you buy an Apple TV and a, basically a router in one package for a price of $150, you know, $129, $199? Uh, where is your cutoff point? Would this even fit into you know something that you'd want to buy at all? Uh, be sure to let us know down below in the comments. Sticking on the Apple train here, we're going to jump over to iOS in the car. Uh, we have heard a bit about this, but I mean, we have ne not really seen any in-depth videos. That's gone. We actually have a pretty in-depth video. It looks to be kind of a developer uh, on his Mac. He has kind of like a, an emulated car screen here with an emulated iPhone running maps and stuff. And so um, it looks very nice. What are your initial impressions of this? Uh, my initial impressions of it actually looks pretty well. Now, you guys have to, you know, excuse the video for certain things because, of course, you can see a mouse pointer and, you know, it's going to be clicking over to, like, the iPhone's physical home button and then back on the UI. <laughs> so, you know, excuse those little things, but this is a, yeah. uh, a simulation. Um, but pretty much the developer, Stephen, uh, looks like, 
uh, Throughton Smith um, posted a video here, uh, which looks like to be on an iOS simulator. It's going to be actually running an 800 by 480. Um, it's going to be basically the design of what Apple is trying to incorporate something to have iOS inside of your car. And of course, one of the biggest features are going to be more than likely, you know, your call app, email client, and of course, the maps. Everyone wants navigation. Everyone, you know, are a lot more on the go nowadays. And being able to have all those features in your car would be great. Now, like I said, we have to excuse the whole mouse because I'm pretty sure yeah. texting and driving is pretty, you know, dangerous. But <laughs> of course, using a mouse while driving, probably a little bit worse. <laughs> so just a um, little. Yeah. But they um, from this uh, actual design that's here it's actually a slightly different from the one that was presented last year at wwdc conference um and some of the different features of of this particular uh app it's actually going to support multiple resolutions uh touch screens um uh, it's going to have no multitasking though i'm not sure if that's something they're going to add later or what but as of right now no multitasking there's no physical keyboard um, um with it as well but there's some good features features like being able to whitelist um to specific apple apps that maybe that you know you want to let through or even be able to blacklist certain things that you don't want to come through so mm -hmm. i think it's going to be nice anything that you try to in integrate with you know your mobile uh and you know in your car and everything like that um uh, it always works well like for example um, I have a Bluetooth head unit that has no physical moving parts. There's no uh, CD slot or anything like that. Well, I Bluetooth stream music to my um, car with my iPhone or with my uh, iPod Classic uh, 80 gig through a USB 30-pin um, cable. So it's really, really nice to be able to put all that uh, together and have that for that ultimate driving experience. And then I think people, they like seeing the same interface in multiple locations especially if it works the same except but you know if you go in here and your you know your navigation feature has some crazy ridiculous robust you know ui design but then you go on your phone and you can get it just like that but if you could take all that and put it into your car and be on the go i think it'll work 10 times better um yeah but yeah it seems it seems really nice i like the simulation that they have here and you know, it says the uh, iOS uh, in the car is expected to make an appearance in vehicles in 2014, and Apple's already uh, working on Audi, BMW, Chrysler, General Motors, Jaguar, Land Rover, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, and Toyota to um, uh, implement some features. And one of the features is going to be called Siri Eyes Free Features. So definitely something that's more likely going to be some steering wheel controls and things like that to help you keep your eyes definitely on the road and off, you know, some screen or UI or anything that's going to distract you from anything uh, causing accidents. Because, of course, with things like this that you implement, you have to have safety as your number one factor because people are going to be operating this while they're driving. So what do you think about this, Bobby? Would you use something like this? Absolutely. Uh, I find myself, uh, you know, I always go to Pittsburgh to see my girlfriend and stuff. And so we'll go to new places and, you know, I've, I've never been to some of these places. So naturally I have my phone. I have a little mount on my dashboard. I, so I just put my phone there and I, I have maps and Siri talks to me and stuff. And it's nice. But um, there's, there's plenty of people that have actually taken an iPad mini and like made a mod in their car and had the, the iPad mini installed in their car as their head unit. And so there's obviously some, obviously some kind of a demand for this. And so uh, even my mom, she just bought a, a brand new uh, Toyota RAV4 and it does have a screen in the dashboard kind of like this. And of course, uh, you know, the phone can hook up via Bluetooth and everything. So uh, I, I actually think that her car is ready to go with this out and we just don't really know it yet. And so uh, with that said, and uh, with the rumors of 7.1, uh, coming out very soon. Uh, actually, I think we just hit beta five the other day. Uh, do you think that this will be released alongside seven point one? Um, honestly, I'm not sure if it'll be released on the on side of seven point one. I'm I'm not sure how far they are in their development of everything, and I don't. Then I don't know if there's some sort of a rollout feature, almost like an Android software update. And what I mean by that is since we're dealing with different car manufacturers, I don't know if BMW has to give the green light or if Chrysler has to give the green yeah. light once they, you know, receive it. I don't know if it's something like that. So maybe that's going to be a feature that's going to actually, you know, once it's just out there in the broadcast, it's out there and the car companies are going to have to come up with, okay, now we have it, and now they have it, and now, you know, something like that. So maybe they'll just launch and say, hey, it's available, 
But I think it'd be kind of hard to do that and say, hey, it's available, but call the car companies. I don't know what's going on yep. with that. You know, but, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll definitely see. I think it's going to actually come out in like little in smaller phases and um, we'll see what happens in between the car manufacturers and see how fast they're going to get those rolled out. And of course, we're going to probably see it in your more hiring vehicles first. You know, I'm pretty sure your BMW, yeah. Land Rover and Mercedes and things will get that <laughs> first. But that doesn't mean that General Motors and Toyota and all those other companies aren't right there on the way. If not, maybe even first and maybe a complete role reversal but we're definitely keeping an eye on this article and figure out what what's going on and uh and see if we can get that ios in the car to all you guys yeah i, I would like us to be wrong i'd like to say that you know behind the scenes apple has contracts with all these different car companies that say okay we'll be we'll all be ready on this one day go ahead and release it that would be nice but uh, i'm kind of with you i don't think that'll happen but Fingers crossed, because <laughs> yeah. this does look really cool. So, uh, guys, go ahead and watch the video uh, if you want to watch it again and get a better look on it. Uh, be sure to tell us what you think about it in the comments. Would you use it in your car? Uh, do you think that this, you, you could benefit from something like this on the Android platform or the Windows mobile platform? Whatever it is, down below, you know what to do. Uh, moving on, more Apple stuff, of course. Uh, we're actually going to talk about Apple's quarter four earnings report. And, uh, yeah, they, they made some money last uh, last quarter. Uh, you know, the holiday quarter is typically probably the biggest for just about any company, especially technology. Uh, so uh, go ahead and walk us through. How much uh, how much did Apple take from us, Dante? Wow. Um, an astronomical <laughs> number, something I wish I could just have lying around. But Apple reports a 57.6% billion <laughs> dollar revenue with a b for the, yes with a b capital b <laughs> revenue for the quarter one 20 uh 2014 and that includes 51 million with iphones 26 million ipads 4.8 million max and 6 million in ipods and those numbers are astronomical as i said before um down in the article here we have it says apple reported the uh a re reportedly record a quarterly revenue of 57.6 billion which lands in between its guidance for the quarter of 55 and 58 billion that they were kind of on track for by the estimate analysis averaging an approximately 58.1 billion it also reported a net quarterly profit of 13.1 billion or $14.50 per diluted share. This is those numbers are compared to the revenue of the $54.5 billion and the net profit of $13.1 billion reported in the same quarter last year. Now, a breakdown of device sales from the quarter one of two, uh, 2014 included 51 million in iPhone sales, 26 and iPad, and both all time quarterly highs for those both, both those categories. Uh, 6 million iPods and 4.8 million Macs. Prior to today's report, it says the consensus from an average uh, analyst estimates pre predicted Apple would sell approximately 55 million iPhones, 25 million iPads, and 4.6 million Macs. So they're pretty much right on track and right on target to what their estimated analysis were versus the real world numbers and quarterly sales of everything that has happened. And this is just the beginning of 2014. So. Yeah. This is awesome. I mean, to me, it just shows that Apple has continued to innovate and more people are switching over and um, they're actually making a profit because you have to realize, you know, one thing that people kind of gripe about Apple about is they don't really have a lot of sales. Exactly. You know, there's not like <laughs> Apple's big blowout, 75 percent off coming to <laughs> at Tech Habit Weekly. You know, so um, there's usually not some sort of a big doorbuster blowout on Apple products or anything like that. So yeah. you got to realize people are paying full price for these things. That's how they're getting these numbers. They're not getting it off your buddy on Craigslist who sold his Mac four or five times. They get this is these are real world consumer numbers of people going and scanning things at the register, buying online, building Macs online, and things like that, and buying iPods in the store. So these numbers are very very huge and very very nice. And I think that nowadays people when they buy uh, Apple products, they're now getting into an investment instead of just getting into a device because that's kind of how I feel with my my 32 gig iPhone 5s. I feel like I invested enough to have a 32 gig pocket computer around when I need it and it's not just a phone to me I use it for a lot of different features but this is nice I'm glad that you know Apple were um, they're able to keep the steam going as far as the post Steve Jobs era and be able to still rake in that money and um, the profit that the company so deserves off their innovation and that to me it just shows that the design team and different innovators and the uh, production and developers that are all in Apple are all coming together to make sure that they're coming out with 
quality products for their consumers. And I think this is really good. And I think I just want this to go even higher because I am an Apple user. And, you know, there's no fanboyism or anything on this. It's just I really like these numbers because it shows that these things are going to only get better, especially with the education um, contracts that they're been signing with iPads and things here in Kansas City. There's a whole district in Kansas City where all the kids at a certain age, they all get MacBook Airs, every last kid. So wow. there's no excuse <laughs> that, well, we can't write that paper because we don't have a computer you know it's like well hey you got the computer and guess what we got wi-fi at school you know here nice in the library <laughs> and so yeah and it's a nice computer it's not just some you know hand me down dell or anything like that and i'm just using dell as an example no you know watch out no <laughs> shots you know <laughs> but just using dell as an example you know it's just it's not some hand me down dell that's you know four or five years old and you know has robust technology and things like that you know and i think that it's very good to see what happens even further as they innovate because there's things that we haven't talked about yet you know like all the speculation behind the iWatch, you know, new Mac Mini and things like that. There's still things coming out there and still innovation. So we'll definitely see these quarterly numbers go up and especially uh, acquiring new markets of cell phone and mobile providers that are outside of the continental United States of places that didn't used to have the iPhone as a primary carrier to even come into their jurisdiction <laughs> to be sold. It's so yeah, it's going to be nice. <laughs> exactly. And that's huge. So we'll see. I mean, nice numbers. You know, this is just a little information for just kind of the enterprise side of Apple. But I think it's nice. And, you know, if you guys think that Apple can only go so far and hit a cap and start to decline or you feel like they're going to get just better from here, leave us a comment below. Yeah, it makes an interesting thing that just kind of popped in my mind. I wonder how what these numbers would be if the Hackintosh didn't exist. Because I know the Hackintosh is kind of gaining traction too. There's more and more people every day deciding that, hey, I, I, I want a Mac Pro level performance in a case that's more expandable, upgradable. And if that option didn't exist, it makes me wonder if these numbers wouldn't be even bigger. Uh, so that's, that's, that's something that just kind of crossed my mind. But even so, I mean, I have a Hackintosh and I mean, I have a MacBook back here. I have Apple keyboard, <laughs> trackpad, magic mouse here. <laughs> My girlfriend has a Hackintosh. She has two 27-inch uh, cinema displays. Uh, a, a lot of people that use Hackintosh still buy Apple accessories, which, because the experience of that is so good, gets them to buy other Apple hardware. So it makes you wonder how the numbers would be affected. If you know they'd still be about the same, just because of the accessories that all these Hackintosh users are buying, yeah. or if you know the number would actually be a lot bigger if you know Apple got the full you know their hardware not just the accessories. Uh, but then again, maybe if people couldn't build a Hackintosh, they wouldn't want to switch to OS X in the first place. So the, cool. whether the, the Hackintosh is a nice gateway into OS X, which will then be a gateway into real Apple accessories, it's it's hard to say, but uh, be sure to let us know what you guys think about that down below in the comments. Because I know for me, uh, for an absolute fact that I, ever since building my Hackintosh, I, I once again, real Macs are all around me. And yeah. so it was kind of a gateway for me. And so and I can't, I don't ever plan on buying a PC, you know, like a, a Walmart PC, a Best Buy PC right. ever again. <laughs> right. Yep. And true story sitting right in front of you. Start off as a Hackintosh on my first. I, I didn't get my first legit Mac until well after Hackintoshing and using Dell Mini 10 netbooks and things like that. And now 12 core Mac Pro, 2009 white uh, unibody MacBook. You know, um, <laughs> I've got, and this is kind of ridiculous, but. I'll show you guys anyway. <laughs> there are <laughs> two <laughs> of these wireless uh, Bluetooth keyboards here. You know, Magic Mouse, Magic Trackpad, you know, uh, iPad dock, you know, iPhone dock. I mean, there, yeah, there's Apple accessories everywhere. And I'm just glad here. that, you know, but yeah, it all started from, and it's funny because I bought both of these items on my Hackintoshes. I didn't have these on legit Macs at first, you know, and, you know, I, I have them and yeah. I think it's nice. So we'll, we'll definitely, like I said, keep an eye on it and it's going to be good to go. So let us know if you guys started off that way, uh, you know, if you guys started off Hackintoshing or maybe even started um, doing Hackintoshes just because of Bob's channel and some of the hard work that he's put in from RoachTechnology.com to give you guys the Hackintosh tutorials and videos about it, you know, let us know down in the comments below. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, on the same, you know, OS X kind of story here, uh, we have Apple executives claiming that iOS and OS X will not merge and that 10.10 .10 will prove that. Uh, this is something that I, I, I think everyone at some point probably, you know, last year kind of speculated that, you know, the, the platforms are getting closer and closer together and eventually there's just going to be one main operating system. And this is kind of this is the story I was referencing earlier when we were talking about 
uh, the whole Microsoft story and what the, what they're going for in Windows 8. How you know, I I kind of suggest that maybe they'll break it off to be Windows 8 Touch or Windows 8 Desktop or something. And from this story, it seems that that's exactly what Apple is sticking to: is to have a, a separate you know touch, uh, an interface made for touch for the mobile, and you know something that still wants to use some kind of an input device other than just your finger touching things for a desktop platform. Uh, so Dante, uh, do you think that this is a relief to you that you know Apple has absolutely no plans to merge into One OS? Would that benefit you, uh, or are you really glad that it's really not anything that they're looking into? I'm actually really glad that they're leaving it alone because it works so well the way it is. I mean, iOS is one thing and Mac OS is another thing. I think it's yep. the best thing is to keep it separate. I would hate to see a mouse pointer or the little thumb guy on my phone app, you know, or, <laughs> you know, it's it's just a complete different experience. That's why, you know, I don't want to sit here and go back to like the Palm pre days or something where you're trying to like scroll this little ball and, you know, things like that to try to get your mouse to go over because that's a different type of feel, you know, and some people like it. I absolutely hate it. I glad I'm glad that I hope they stay as far away from that as possible because there mm -hmm. are mobile operating systems and there are desktop architecture. You know, um, I don't want to touch my MacBook, you know, to get the mail or Safari to you know pop up hitting the compass. You know, that's why there's a, a trackpad for you know for a keyboard and keyboard and mice. You know, for that. And I think the if they keep it separate, it'll work fine. If they merge it, we've got Windows 8. Yeah, absolutely. And Apple, I think they realized this even before Microsoft did Windows 8. I think they they could have, you know, followed suit and did something like that, but I think they were they were smart to, you know, not and I'm sure they do have stuff like this in their labs. You know, I'm sure they have at some point tested, you know, a touch MacBook or, you know, any kind of these, you know, hybrid devices and they felt that it just didn't work out and they continued to do their own thing. Apple definitely feels that, you know, a tablet should not have a physical keyboard attached to it. You know, it could be an option, but it's not something that should, you know, come bundled in the same box because they are for two entirely different uses. And so, you know, not a, that there are some people that, you know, on a tablet, you do want a physical keyboard, but that's not for everybody. And at the end of the day, that kind of makes it not really a tablet anymore. So I think this is an absolutely amazing thing because it's like you said, I'm not going to run Final Cut on a a website that looks like mobile or you know optimized to be a mobile OS and I'm not going to run you know flappy birds with a keyboard and mouse so <laughs> <laughs> so I mean it, it's very good that you know this rumor I think could finally be put to rest and that Apple uh, there was actually a story that they were also talking about this on Mac Break Weekly um, there is a story that Apple really believes that people that do attach these devices uh, you know like a keyboard to a tablet they're simply barking up the wrong tree and that you know when you take out when you take notes in class or something you in your mind you pick a, a specific device for that task and that one device isn't going to be the go-to device for every single task so it only makes sense that you have you know a laptop that's optimized for taking notes or you know a tablet that's optimized for you know maybe playing games or you know something like that like a, a lighter workload but Apple knows that people that have a really heavy workload need a heavy machine to do that workload on and that's exactly why you know as we were talking about earlier that Windows 8 in theory, sounds awesome. It sounds like you're uniting everything, making it simple, but in practice, it simply just doesn't work because there's way too many use cases. And technology, unfortunately, is not a market. It's not an industry where one size fits all because it absolutely does not. So right. I think that this is a very, very good thing. Uh, I like my OS 10 the way it is. Uh, there are some things in OS 10 I could see that get, uh, taking the design from iOS. Maybe you know OS 10.10 .10 will see maybe some flatter icons or you know something right, like that. But right. the overall functionality will definitely remain the same. Uh, right. Do you think there is anything that they could take from iOS that would not affect the functionality, or you know maybe could affect the functionality but in a positive way? Oh, hmm, that's a really good question. The only thing I could think of is maybe. I don't know, maybe more customizable notification center. I mean, the notification center is pretty strong right now in Mac OS, but certain things and certain apps, I think, could have, you know, some of the way that the iOS 7 notifications are. And um, but that that's about it. I mean, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, yeah, because a, a lot of things are already integrated pretty well. I think I think they can, yeah. like you said, flatter icons, that would be perfect. More little, you know, iOS 7-ish type icons I think would be nice, you know, because, you know, OS 10 has looked up the same for a, for a while. I think it's about time to get, a, you know, some, you know, updated icons and things like that, you know, and um, hopefully 
things just stay the way they are because I hope to God one day we are not going to the stores to go buy a 27 inch iMac touch. So, we'll see, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I hope not. <laughs> I will say one thing they, they, they try to take from iOS to make it better is Launchpad. Uh, you know, I don't know a single person that uses Launchpad. You know, it's very simple to access, but what's great about Launchpad is that you'll never even have to know it's there if you don't want to use it. I mean, you have there's a certain gesture that's very easy to activate, but mm -hmm. not required. So personally, I never use it, and on my on a day to day basis, I f forget it's even there. Yeah. Uh, but it's just something that Apple did try to take from iOS and bring it to the desktop, and, and I, I think that I'm was kind of the way. Did, I'm glad they didn't put so it. much emphasis on it too. I'm yeah. I'm glad they're not like. Hey, you guys aren't using that. You know, come on, use that launch pad. Use that, use that launch pad, you know, or what something the heck, like that. Guys? But, right. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Good thing. Um, I'm sorry. I just now remembered this um, because of the tech tree that I had uh, a couple shows ago about having that lock screen on there. Now, if that was native in Mac OS, that would be there awesome. There you go. Because, you know, that's, I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, man, that's, that's nice because I, I made it match my phone. And that way you can kind of, you know, keep things the same. And I've got three monitors set up here, 24-inch uh, monitors now. It'd be nice to have, like, maybe the lock screen in the middle and maybe two other things going on, you know, things like that. So, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty nice. I, yeah. That, that, that's probably have, the biggest have, thing. Uh, like a lock screen of sorts as a screensaver. So if you're away from your computer for 10 minutes, then the lock screen comes up or something. I mean, yeah. you have it display certain information or, you know, that could that. That's actually very good. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> I would like something that. like that to come through. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, what do you guys think about the two operating systems remaining separate? Is it a good idea? Is it for the better? Is it you know? Do you want that Windows eight interface where it's literally the same exact thing on my phone as it is on my desktop? Uh, be sure to let us know down below in the comments. Uh, moving on, uh, this is actually the last Apple story we have, so that was kind of like the Apple intermission, I guess. Uh, this is the last story related to Apple, but Apple has recently celebrated the 30 years of the Macintosh. It was actually January 30th, 1984 is when Steve Jobs pulled the Mac out of the bag and showed it to the world. And so, uh, Dante, what do you think about this? I mean, uh, were you, what's, I, I guess I'll ask, what is the first Mac that you ever owned? Uh, the first Mac that I've ever owned was an a 13 inch MacBook Air. Um, it was the old slow one. It's, it had like the 80 gig hard drive or something like the actual iPod hard drive. I mean, if you guys knew that that's when that first thin design came out, they put iPod hard drives in them. And some actually did have solid state drives in um, technology in them, but I had the one with the hard drive. That was my very, 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 very first one. And um, I haven't looked back since. Basically, once that happened, I, I think I still had a Hackintosh in between that. Yeah, I had Hackintosh in between, and then it was just Mac products, Mac products, Mac products from there on out. And 30 years, seeing 30 years of uh, Macintosh products and just going down and just looking at some of the, you know, different Mac computers and the hardware and the specs of it. I mean, it's atrocious to nowadays specs of what, like, your phone could do. It outperforms, like, these things, like, easily. <laughs> and... Um, just to see how far Apple has grown and they're still in the game to be here 30 years. And I think about the competition that was back when um, Apple first came out, you know, 30 years ago. You know, there was companies up the wazoo, names that we, you know, heard of, things that have, you know, come and gone and they're still in the thick of things. And I think that just shows how good their quality line and their product is, you know, throughout the to, to stand the test of time this entire time. And, you know, just the specs here of this particular, this is uh, January 24, 1984, Macintosh 128K, and the price was $2,495, <laughs> you know, and Oof. it's ridiculous. And it, the hardware is a Motorola <laughs> 68,008 uh, 68, megahertz CPU, 128K, 128K, not megabyte, gigabyte, 128k of ram 64k rom and nine inch black and white five uh 512 by three um 42 monitor 400k three and a half inch floppy for some of you younger people you know there was this thing called a floppy drive and people used it all the time, you know, and they came in different sizes. But this particular one had a uh, a three and a half inch, which is pretty big. But there actually was a five and like a quarter one, too. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, very old technology. But it just, it's just nice to see where it started from to where it has gone now. They continue to innovate and they innovated even with this design here. And, you know, 
I'd like to see 30 more, you know, and see what Apple has to do here. I mean, because even just scrolling down with this article to see, uh, you know, the Macintosh portable back in 1989 with the LCD screen and the first Macintosh LC. I mean, and then when you actually got into the PowerBook lines and then the iBook and then, you know, you even have an old uh, iMac G3 that's actually sitting back behind you. And, you know, I remember going to school using those things and they, it was awesome when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. And, it was awesome. Matter of fact, those were the ones that always ran better. You know, we had yeah, uh, they have those. Like those and, circle and, mouse. And, <laughs> yep, I remember all that. Yeah, and then of course, you know, with the clamshell, you know, type uh, iBook, and you know, and just yep. going on and on and on and on, all the way into now. You know, even with the uh, the 2013 MacBook, I'm uh, sorry, 2013 Mac Pro line, it you can just see how many design differences and the schemes that they went to, but they kept a lot of things the same once they actually got to a point with the premium uh, product of having like that brushed aluminum feel. I'm glad they stayed on that architecture because oh, yeah. it is very, very sleek. I love the fact that when I stack everything up, that it's about that color all the time. And yeah. it's really nice having those refined edges and things. And yeah, like I said, here, you know, Congratulations. I'm glad that Apple stuck around this long. And here's the 30 more. As far as being a person that five, four or five years ago didn't touch a Mac. So I'm, I'm glad. So I'm, I'm really happy. What do you guys think? Do you guys think this is something that will just die out? Do you think someone will just buy Apple? You know, they'll make a really bad business decision. <laughs> or, you know, do you think you see them going for 30 more years to celebrate their 60th anniversary? And maybe we'll be able to see the iPhone 5S and, you know, and things like that on the old list of lines you know, from here, from uh, in the future. So let us know. Yeah, and uh, if you guys haven't seen it already, if you go to Apple's website, they actually have a page dedicated to their 30 years. I believe it's just apple.com slash 30 hyphen years. And there's actually, it takes you through uh, year by year, the whole history since 1984, and, you know, the highlights of every year in terms of what, you know, what Apple product was at the spotlight that year and how it changed. And uh, you can really see how Apple's evolved, the people that were involved. And it's, it's really just a really interesting timeline. To it, The website also has done very well. Uh, there's tons of CSS. It's really nice to you know just go through and see everything. Uh, they actually also made a video uh, about their 30 years, and it was shot completely on iPhones. Now, granted, it was edited entirely on Macs, of course. Uh, they, I think they did the whole project within uh, 36 hours, and they had you know hours upon hours. I think they had about 75 hours worth of raw footage just from the iPhone, caught it down into like, you know, a one to two minute video. Uh, but they also, they have the video up, you know, of what they shot. Also a behind the scenes clip too. It's right on their YouTube channel. I think it's just youtube.com slash Apple, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, feel free to look at it there. Uh, of course, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, but uh, or actually, yeah, it's actually being showed right now um, in, in the podcast. But it's a really nice video. And uh, it really demonstrates how good the cameras in the iPhone are. Uh, there's, there might be other phones that can get a better shot in some kind of a situation, but I think all around usage, uh, you know, the iPhone definitely has the better, or, uh, I guess, like the the most robust camera in all these different situations. But uh, just getting back to the 30 years, I hope we have a 30 years for the iPhone. That would be in 2037, uh, so it's a little bit off yet, but uh, I do think that we'll get there. And I, like as Dante said, I think we'll get at least another 30 years out of the Mac at the rate that it's going at. So uh, be sure to let us know what you guys think down below in the comments about Matt, uh, Apple's Macintosh turning 30 years old uh, just very recently. So like I said, uh, we're going to get off of the, the uh, Apple intermission there, and now we're going to talk about Google and their quarter four earnings. Uh, in short, you know they're up 17%, kind of comparable to Apple. Uh, I, I believe in the profits, they actually uh, made a bit more than Apple did, which you know that's a really good chunk of change. Sure. Uh, Dante, go ahead and uh, break it down a little bit more for us. Okay. I mean, basically, like you said, in short, you know, Google just announced a fourth quarter earnings uh, as a result of a holiday quarter announcing consolidated revenues of $16.86 billion, like you said, up 17% since last year, a quarter in earnings per share, $12.01, so just a little below Apple. Apple is about $14.50, um, uh, but as a net income of $3.38 billion. That compares to analyst estimates that average somewhere around $16, uh, I'm sorry, $16.75 billion revenue and 12.26 earnings per share, which is huge. Um, and there's just a little statement here. It says, uh, we ended 2013 with another great quarter of growth, and your standalone revenue was up 22% um, year to year at $15.7 billion, and that's uh, coming from Larry Page, the CEO of Google. And he uh, has a statement here that we make great progress across a wide range of products and improvements and business goals. Um, 
also very excited about improving people's lives and even more uh, continue with hard work and um, on our user experiences. Now, I think one of the big things that comes from this acquisition and all these quarterly earnings, there is a big, 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 big push with the Chromebooks in education. Google and education, that's like their new thing. They're tackling education. They were yep. in a category where they weren't in at all, and now they have made a substantial dent in that category, and they actually beat Apple in that category. <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, the numbers were huge as far as uh, a category that you weren't in at all, and then you jump in and you just blow it almost out the water, and that's pretty good, you know. And you know, these things are yet to be seen, but I've seen the um, Google Apps for Education and you know different things, different uses for the Google Drive and things like that. They they're implementing a lot more things with their catalog that they uh, currently have, and I think it's nice. I mean, of course, Google is making a lot of money. I mean, you got to realize where does YouTube come from? You got to realize you know the search engine, and you know, of course, Android and things like that. So they're doing a lot. A lot of stuff. So when you think Samsung's numbers are huge on their devices, who's <laughs> supporting their devices operating system? So it's basically like <laughs> their check is this big, but who's writing their check? You know, it's one of those yep. things. Like, oh yeah, here you guys go. Yeah. So um, and, and and vice versa. You know, what are those contracts that Samsung has to have to have uh, the Android operating system on their uh, Samsung Galaxy S4s and things like that? So I mean, they're making a ton of money, and they're not going to stop. I mean. Google's been innovating. I mean, of course, with the whole Google Fiber, you know, I never, you know, Apple doesn't have its own ISP, you know, so it's just some categories of these companies that there's just like no competition. So you got to realize, I'm sure those are going to thrive those numbers too. Um, and being able to house these new facilities and, you know, make money and do things the right way. And of course, with the Google Maps and things like that, you know, and of course, we had knew about a while ago where Apple's Maps was just still buggy, and even to this day. At my Apple's ma Apple Maps aren't very very reliable, so um, that's why some people still do keep the Google Map app on their phone or their iPad or whatever, and it's still good because that just lets you know how much effort they're actually putting into it, and the numbers are showing. So these numbers are nice, and you know we're going to see them going. And I'm, there's always going to be Google. Google's not going anywhere anytime soon because as they continue to innovate, and they're definitely making money. So this is very nice to see this. Yeah, it's, it, and what something I find interesting is, I mean, Apple did, you know, in terms of overall, you know, profit, everything, they did pretty close to as good as, you know, how good Google did, and yet their stock price really doesn't resemble it. I mean, if you look at Google's stock price, it's like through the roof. I mean, it's like uh, up over a thousand now per share, whereas Apple's, I think, is still hovering around the five or six hundred dollar area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we just have to iterate that, you know, raw, you know, profit or revenue does it directly you know one to one correlate to your stock price or anything but uh, it just makes me wonder why the investors you know aren't as happy with Apple as they are with Google despite Apple's crazy successes do you have any input on that because I mean I honestly um, don't really honestly know. The, the biggest thing I can think of in that particular category would have to be the amount of services because you know Apple's bringing out products Google has products and services you know and like I said with the whole ISP thing I think it's uh, safe to say that an investor would probably take more of a gamble to spend into something that they know like an ISP that is lightning fast. It's the fastest thing available and everyone wants it there, you know, and that that to me says, hey, I'll put, you know, a million dollars into that pot. But if they say, hey, here's a new MacBook, you know, pro. And you're like, eh, how many MacBook Pros have I seen? If you're not as techy and geeky as us to know the specs and different <laughs> things that are going down with it, if you're just an investor sitting on a check and you're trying to make money, That's true. you're probably going to shy away from Apple. You're going to go with, okay, I see this. You know, This is a service. People want that. People can buy products all day long. The services are the things that people want are going to be recurring bills. Recurring bills, you know, and even Apple services. I mean, time. they're not they're not as reliable as say as Google's. I mean, iCloud yeah. is hit or miss some days. Uh, not everyone even really uses iTunes Match, and so a lot of Apple services aren't great, especially Siri. There's right. tons of room for improvement. Whereas things like you know Google Google Now is extremely successful, works very well, and you know just Google Search. You know, you're, that's actually a very good point. That you know Google yeah. has a lot more services, and the services actually work yeah. <laughs> as well as they should. You know, it's different when someone's trying to be the standard in that particular technology and innovation, or you are the standard. And a lot of things that Google does, they are the standard. You know, as far as the That's services, true. you know, like 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 we said before, you know, think about who's in competition with Google. You know, Apple and you know, say Microsoft and things like that. Where's Microsoft's you know internet service? You know, 
I don't, you know, you don't see anything. Where's Apple's? You know, where's, you know, so you got to think of those different things, you know, and then having a search engine, the most used search engine. I mean, that's huge, <laughs> you know, so it's like, well, it's just certain areas that they can't compete in. And I don't think they, they would be smart to try to fight their battles in other areas instead of trying to go at them at their strongest point. So, you know, because you could find some people bankrupt, but, you know, it, may, it makes perfect sense that they make a lot of money yeah. because you know, I think, you know, where where's Ash Jeeves? You know where's uh, <laughs> you know think of those other. Remember all those search engines? Oh know? yeah, back in the day. Oh, let me get on, let me get on Netscape and see what's going on on my <laughs> AOL. And, uh, yeah. So it's it's stuff like that. So it makes perfect sense. So yeah, the see. fact that every browser now URL bar isn't a URL bar. At first, it's a search bar for Google by default. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's just that's the age we live in now. So, uh, what do you guys think about Google's revenue? Uh, do you think it'll be better next year? Uh, was it not quite as good as you thought it would be, considering all the services they have? Uh, you know, the sixteen billion dollars is cer certainly not a small check. So, uh, I'm sure that's what you guys think about that. Uh, next, we're also going to talk about a little bit more about Google here, and this is actually you know kind of a three-way match here. What we're going to talk about well, here, we have Lenovo buying Motorola, which was already bought by Google. So, uh, very interesting trifecta going on here. Dante, go ahead and give us your perspective. What exactly does Lenovo have to gain by buying Motorola from Google? Well, number one, I didn't know Lenovo had that much money to buy. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. <laughs> to buy that. And, of course, you know, when we talk about these, this is on very, very, very enterprise level. It's not a hand cash to cash, you know deal, you know, cash for product, you know, there's going to be stocks and rights and, you know, things like that and patents and things. That's that's how people pay for things that cost that much money. That's just how much in dollars that a lot of these things are going to cost. But uh, one of the things is, you know, Lu uh, Lenovo is primarily a PC manufacturer when you, you know, when you start seeing some of their business and enterprise uh, laptops and things like that. Matter of fact, they have them all over my primary job as well. Um, but then also, you know, they have the, um, you know, Lenovo, um, you know, mobile devices and things like that. But trying to get into this game, I think maybe they're struggling. Maybe they want to, you know, get a real, real, real strong, you know, way into the mobile market maybe. You know, of course they have some things, but, you know, no one's talking about, hey, man, did you get the, did you hear about the next Lenovo phone? So some of the specs here of what's going on, Lenovo is nearing uh, a rather stunning deal that would put Motorola cell phone business in its back pocket for roughly $3 billion. That's a lot of money, ladies and gentlemen. And so it's Google's snatched up Motorola in 2011 for $12.5 billion, and since it's slowly broken the company up, scaled back its device lineup, and added a massive pile of patents to its legal arsenal. Now, after losing money for several years straight, Mountain View is uh, reportedly uh, preparing to offload the division on a Chinese computer, on the Chinese computer giant Lenovo. The purchase of Motorola will probably also put to bed rumors that of Lenovo purchasing BlackBerry for at least for now, <laughs> and Motorola uh, existing infrastructure, uh, patent library, and brand recognition should help it make a dent here in the U.S. And basically, that's what they want. I mean, it takes money to make money, especially in a, a market that's this deep. I mean, so they're trying to take resources from wherever they could. I mean, you got to realize, look at how much Google bought them for. You know, that was twelve point five billion dollars, and they're buying them for three. You know, so I think, yeah, so I think they made a very good profit. And then you have to realize what was Google trying to do with them that they weren't successful at. Now, you have to realize on the hierarchy, if you just wanted to put it on a scale or a chart to look at, you know, Google, Lenovo, Motorola, things like that. Well, if Google says, eh, sure, I'll sell it. What does that mean for Lenovo? I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know if they, you know, maybe felt like that acquisition just wasn't being profitable enough even in the inner workings and things that they were doing and they were like yeah so let's just get rid of this this is going to cost us more money i don't know if this is going to be you know pretty much putting on a bad tire you know for lenovo to to try to stand on you know to help them get from state to state i don't think that's going to be a smart move but i'm not sure what lenovo has uh in the works and in plans for motorola and we'll have to see because you know there's things like the moto x and things that sold very well and yeah but I'm not Good sure fun. how much of 
Motorola's input was in that and how much of other, you know, there, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that we as, you know, people sitting outside the company don't know about. So we'll, we'll see what happens with it. You know, Lenovo, you know, they, they're pretty well known in the uh, business and enterprise market. So maybe they're going to try to take, take it over. And I don't know if they'll get rid of Motorola um, per se, you know, like just cancel the line or will they just make that just basically like that's their little sister company or something like that. I'm not quite sure, but, you know, it probably will make an impact on the enterprise market, you know, because for Lenovo, it says the deal means not only um, it's the largest PC maker, but it's also soon to be the third largest handset manufacturer in the Americas and not to mention the second largest cell phone company in China uh, as Lenovo. And, you know, so it's huge, but I'm not too yeah. sure what's going to happen here, you know, but, you know, what, what do you guys think? Do you guys think this is an acquisition just kind of maybe monopolize the competition? Maybe there's a strength in numbers and, of course, acquiring this, you know, like uh, Bob said, at a third of the cost that Google did. You know, what do you guys think that Lenovo has in plans for Motorola with this new acquisition? Yeah, I mean, definitely let us know in the comments. Uh, like you said, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And uh, at the end of the day, I mean, Google knows what they're doing. They're very smart people. Even though they bought the company and sold it for a lot less, uh, in general business practice, that's not a good thing. But you know, throughout the course of that, when they did, you know, own uh, Motorola or at least you know whatever parts of Motorola, uh, they did manage to get all those patents. And I think that's what they were really after. That's something that's really going to benefit them because that's Google saying, "All right, Apple, sue us now." Like yeah. <laughs> Apple, yeah. they've been they've been <laughs> back and forth so much over the years, and fifteen thousand patents on a single product that adds a lot of protection. So I think Google is you know perfectly happy with that, and they it's not like Google doesn't have the money to take a bit of a loss on selling a company. You say all right, you know maybe we got whatever we wanted out of it, so now it's kind of I guess one less thing to worry about, and so you know was. It, It'll be interesting to see what Lenovo does uh, because Lenovo is uh, actually very big outside of the United States, so not not very much inside the United States in terms of uh, you know cell phones. Uh, so Motorola is, and like you said, the, the Moto X sold extremely well. It's actually yeah. a very good phone, and so and, um, Motorola has actually come out to say that you know we're still going to continue to make these products even though that we're not really owned by Google anymore. You know that was us. You know we had that Google backing. You know Google was kind of you know the money. But uh, that product did, in the end, you know, come from Motorola and Motorola only, and so they say that they're going to continue to do that. And so I think um, it'd be good that if Motorola, if say if, uh, Lenovo didn't just close up Motorola, I, I think it'd be smart to let Motorola keep doing what they're doing and just have Lenovo be the backing, give them a few extra things here yeah, and there, you know, fine, and financial so, support, you know, things like yeah. that, and then you know that exposure, of course, into their huge market outside of the U.S. So yeah, it makes perfect sense. You know, but you know, one has to beg to differ. You think of Google as such a titan, like a powerhouse, to let it go. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah, it, it makes you wonder. <laughs> yeah. You know, like when, if I if I hand you down this MacBook, it's because I have a better MacBook. Now I'm not going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to give you my best MacBook. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to be honest, and I'm pretty sure you the most of you guys. Two thousand and gave it to me for five hundred. Right. Not a <laughs> not a smart move on myself, you know. So we'll see. We'll see. Definitely what it's happens. Not a smart with this. move on yourself if it is in fact a fully functioning MacBook and not right. older. Good condition. Turns out to be just the box. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, it's definitely an interesting little love triangle we got going on here between these companies. But uh, I guess now it's not really a triangle. It's kind of like a, a broken triangle with Google being over here. Uh, but let us know what you guys think, what this means for the future of all three of these companies down below in the comments. And the last story today, we're going to close it off with uh, a, a news about an update to Windows 8. Point one has an easier way to shut down and restart. Now I hate to say that that's you know like a, a big thing, but it is. <laughs> if you've never used Windows eight point one or you know, Windows eight in general, uh, you the first thing that you probably asked yourself was how do I shut this thing off? <laughs> like yeah, I mean I should have to do a hard reset. There's bound to be a software button somewhere, and you you have to hover up in some corner to reveal some charms bar. Or you could. I don't know, but uh, what else does this update uh, bring, this update leak, actually? Um, what it says here from the leak, they say that it's supposed to have an improved uh, store app integration and some of the and some time saving tweaks and like you said with the being able to shut down a lot easier. Um, honestly, when I'm using Windows 8, I have to make two decisions. One is to take four steps to shut down my 
you know, virtual machine that I'm running it on or find the nearest flaming hot fork and jab it into my eye for having <laughs> to do it that way. And it's ridiculous that it's like that. Um, some of the different things that they said, the Windows 8 st uh, style apps also pick up a new bar with the close, minimize and snap options and available click on foregoing uh, those keyboard shortcuts or touch swipes. Live tiles are now to have contextual menus available with the right click, making them easier to resize. And that's a huge problem that I had uh, with Windows 8 um, beforehand. And this is a new shutdown button is leaked uh, just last week that throws up a new drop down menu for restarting, shutting down and sleep mode. And this is an experimental build and is apparently three weeks uh, apparently three weeks old already. And it says the raw deal is expected to arrive next month. Now, for those Windows 8 users, if you aren't already so fed up with it and have already switched to Windows 7, this may be a good you know time to go back, you know, once that actually officially comes out. But like I said, it's it's terrible. Sometimes the navigating on that thing doesn't make any yeah. sense. And you know, you can see here from the screenshot on the article here, you know, where the sleep and shutdown restart. It'd be perfect if it was right there because guess what? On my Mac, Apple shut down. Boom. That's it. You know, I don't have it to. It hasn't changed. You no, know, exactly. <laughs> and it hasn't changed, but it was so drastic that I honestly, me and Terrell sat there and was like looking around and we're like, wait a minute. What is it? Now, we're the go to guys in our inner circle as far as, you know, technology and hey, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And sometimes we laugh and we're like, oh my gosh, right click, go down to properties, go to display, under display, you go change resolution, slide your resolution, you know, and we know all those steps because we've seen these menus so many times. We couldn't figure out how to shut it down the first time. We were looking around like, uh, uh okay. But then you we go, wait a minute, when like I was this. over here, <laughs> this funny menu thing keeps popping out, but then you have to hit the gear for settings and then in settings, you have their, I mean, that's, that's too many steps, you know, yeah. and especially There's waiting for similar. it to come out to activate. So that, you know, number one, it's taken them too long to fix that. That's been a problem since it launched. And, you know, fixing it now, I don't know if it was like a kernel problem or something that like just moving. I, I wouldn't imagine just moving something around. It's the same feature would take so much time to fix. But I'm not sure even with those fixes that this will be something that's good enough to save the Windows 8 line as far as the Metro interface and the things. And yes, I know there's ways to disable it and basically almost take it back to the point where it looks basically like a Windows 7 machine. But the problem is, do you want Windows 8 with a Windows 7 skin or do you just want a better operating system? I mean, and I think that they should just go, hey, Windows 9, shut it down and just take your right hand, cut it off and keep using Win Windows uh, 8.1. I don't recommend it. And I'm just a person that's just going off of from, you know, I use Windows 8 on a virtual machine and it's atrocious. I don't like it. You know, the, the, um, what my biggest thing is I'm a grown man and I feel like when I look at it, it dumbs you down. You know, it makes you kind of look like, ooh, I'm a little kid, look, boxes and colors. Hey, this is great. You know, and I need I need something like a little more technical, you know, and that's where the whole, you know, the Mac lineup, and I'm just using that as an example, even a lot of Linux distros make you feel like, yes, I am a tech user, you know, with the stainless steel looks and things like that, you know, but loud, bright colors and boxes and, you know, and of course their icons are atrocious. You know, a lot yeah. of people, um, you know, they get on the iOS 7's icons and believe me, I'm not a fan of all the icons, but those icons, I mean, it's like a three-year-old could use it and maybe that's what they're going for. They're trying to span it across so many, you know, age groups that you have to hit that age group too. But, you know, I just think they need to for just the rest of us. <laughs> say, yeah, slice it, Windows 9, we're going to fix it. You know, they did they did it with uh, Vista. You know, when when Vista came out, I went back to win, Windows XP. Windows 7 came out, I was so happy. And that's why I'm still running Windows 7 on, on a virtual machine yeah. and a boot camp right now. I use the virtual machines for uh, college, but then the boot camp when I play my Windows games. And I love it. I have no problems with it. I learned a lot of features and a lot of things with Windows 7. But Windows 8, there's not a thing to be learned besides stress level, heart, you know, Heart, heart beat, conditions. you know, per, per minute, you know, <laughs> blood pressure, you know, things like that's the only thing that you're going to get headache. You're going to be buying aspirin a lot more and may develop, you know, develop an addiction to painkillers. But if they fix it, it'll be fine. These little things, not so much. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. You know, if you guys just think they should just can this line, say, you know what, forget it. We're going to go to Windows 9 and stop doing these little incremental updates to say, hey, you know, we're going to give you the, you know, 
the ability to shut down your PC like a normal living, breathing human being that doesn't have to comb through the registry or 15 lines of code and do some command prompt, you know, hacks to access it. So well, here's one last thing. Yep. Why is a start button like, you know, so huge? it's this big for some <laughs> reason, but everything else like you have to, uh, oh, I do not know. I cannot find the mess. Duh. It, it's ridiculous, you know. I don't know why it, it. It almost it just makes you feel dumb. Almost, you know. It's like, hey, start button right here, and but everything else is really hard to find. Like, you know, certain. You ever try to search for like, you know, just certain things in like with their little search tool? It's almost impossible because there's like a separate search for every spot. You know, you can't just like search all. I mean, you can do it, but you have to know how to do it. So, say if you go into you know, music and hit search or something and you search it for music, then it might not find it because, oh, that's inside a folder that's inside the music folder. And I'm like, are you serious? You know, and then you go <laughs> navigate another way and you can find it just fine. So that's yeah. just some of the, you know, nightmares that I've come across with Windows 8. Not a big fan of it. Don't like it at all. You know, I wish it would burn, or, you know, on the next flight down or something, you know, and destroy all the copies and digital rights management and everything. But that's just me. Yeah, so. uh, fix it, Nadella. <laughs> uh, this is your big project. This will, this is what I. If you fix this, I'll I'll like you. <laughs> yeah, I like oh, you a whole it. lot. Oh, I'll fix it a lot. It'll be <laughs> just flattened like completely. It'll it'll be things that you can point and click. You know, you think the I interface understand. is flat now? <laughs> well, yeah, that's ridiculous. I mean, that thing's so flat it might cut you. But I mean. I understand the whole touch thing. I understand it. I understand the touch thing. It, and it does work good on the ta on the tablet. There's a buddy of mine at school that does have a Windows Surface. It works fine on the, on the Surface. But using this as a desktop is ridiculous, you know. And I don't know of anybody but a few, hand, you know, maybe a handful of people who actually do like it for a desktop operating system. And I've just heard a lot of bad reviews. I mean, number one, it was hard enough to get certain people to even – Go to a PC or a laptop anyway because they're you know they're older and they're like eh, I don't I'm not going to be you know going into this technology but then when they do and they see Windows 8 and they're like there's no way I'm going to use that you know yeah. a lot of people don't like it so it's just it's not my it's not my opinion it's it's facts so yeah I mean, I, even at work we just leased about 20 new brand new laptops and they have Windows 7 stickers on them so that says something right there. There you go. <laughs> Spending money so, right uh, now, I mean, Windows 8 is going to be right out the box. Hey, that's what you want. It's new. It's newer, <laughs> you know? No, 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 no. We want that, that last update, you know, the one you guys did, That was right? good. That was good. You know, but didn't expand enough. Would it have two service packs, you know? And I'm like, wait a minute, you know? I don't know. I mean, I don't think they squeezed enough juice out of, the, you know, that limit, yeah. but we'll see. Yeah. I don't know, but be sure to let us know uh, down in the comments what you guys think about this entire thing. Uh you already know how we feel. We feel very, very strongly about this. Uh, you now know how we feel <laughs> in terms of Windows 8. So is this, you know, this quote, unquote, this quote unquote, like major update from this leak? Uh, is this enough to win you over to get you to keep using Windows 8? Uh, maybe you, you went, use Windows 8, you went back to 7. Are you going to try it again now that things like this are easier to find? Be sure to let us know down below in the comments. So we've reached the end of the, the episode today in terms of our tech stories, but now we have the sweetest part of the show for you, our tech treats. This is something that got us through the past week. Uh, it, it's technology related, whether it's software, hardware, you know, some kind of an accessory, a product, whatever have you. Uh, this is just that part of the show where you know we, we like to share with you uh, something that's helped us in the past week, or in this case, two weeks since we did our last show. So Dante, what's your tech treat for the week? Uh, my tech tree is actually an app that's in the um, iOS app store that is called Spark. Now, Spark is really nice. It's the app here. It's kind of a really, you know, Ooh. you know, simple interface. Basically, what you can do, one of the main features I like, I mean, you can record uh, video on the go, but it goes as long as your thumbs are, like, pressed. So as soon as you let go, it stops. You know, and then you can even flip the camera and different things like in the in the middle of it while it's recording. And it's really nice. And I think I might have had some privacy or something not set. But anywho, once you press, you know, hold it down, it's actually recording as we, you know, see here. And then I can flip over and show the the opposite camera, you know. So now that's the the opposite camera there. Sorry, I probably got my fingers and whatnot in the way. And it will record just as long as you have it pressed here. So you guys can kind of see what's going on here. And, you know, and once you let go, it stops. 
And I think that's really nice because they got a bunch of different, you know, uh, filters on it. I think there's 10 filters that you can actually uh, go through. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just really nice. I mean, I like it just because of the fact that, you know, normally if you even in our phones, you know, with the uh, stock app of the uh, camera app, you can't just flip back and forth. You know, you got to choose it first. You know, so um, once you start, say, a front facing camera recording, pretty much has to stay that way, you know, and with this. I like the fact that you can just flip it and do it on the go. That's you neat. can share it. Yeah, it's really neat. And it's, and it's very, very minimum when it comes to the actual uh, UI of it. I mean, it's very simple. You know, the icons aren't, you know, just all over the place. And it's, there's no learning curve or anything, I don't think. And, um, you know, it's nice because you, you can share these uh, different things. You can even put music to them in, in your uh, phone's library or your iPod Touch's library, uh, something like that, just to make a nice little, you know, just like a nice little clip. And it's... it's, it's Pretty, pretty nice idea, you know, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of, um, I, and I guess there's more updates coming soon too, and it is nice because you can get this, um, you have to have this for iPhone 4S and higher though, so just some of you guys who may have some older devices, just keep that in mind, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really nice, it's called Spark Camera, and this is in the uh, Apple App Store, so really nice. It's, it's funny, I, I, and it's funny because I actually, you know, I'm trying to see if I still have that video, I might have deleted it, but... I had a video that I was just testing out the front and rear camera, and I just kept hitting, kept hitting it, and trying to see <laughs> if I have it. Oh, do I have it here? I may. Let's see. Oh, so was no, it just kind of like not... a test to see the diff, like the transition yeah, between yeah, the cameras? Yeah, basically. You're right. And if I can find my, oh, okay. I just have to swipe over. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I don't know how well you can see that, but that's there. You know, and I just got a bunch of chips and whatnot, and I'm just moving the camera around. And now making I me hungry, it. man. Yeah, so now I got it flipped, and then I'm just you know looking around like, ah, oh, this is kind of cool, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> that's definitely neat. So, yeah, so it's it, it's nice something that uh, you guys can just use on the go, and um, it's it's very small. There's not a lot to it. Once you launch the app, you're ready to go. There's no oh, you just sign up and do this, and then fill this out, and then, you know click this and click that, and and then you're set up. And now, hey, do you want to like us on Facebook? Okay, now do you? There's not a lot. It just pops up. It's ready to go, and you can and go. I it is. I wouldn't use this like as a replacement for the you know recording app because of course like I said you have to hold it down while doing it but it's really nice if you're doing stuff on the go and you have to go oh, oh stop you know instead of oh crap let me um 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 um, um you know <laughs> and 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 try to stop it that way as soon as you let go pressure it stops and like I said just being able to flip the camera forward and backward is nice too so yep guys should just at least try it out I mean um it was free when I got it but honestly I think it's like one ninety nine now so yeah I think it's don't quote me on that yeah but. <laughs> It was weird, but I got it. I got it for free just nice. you know, last week. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe I got the deal of the week. <laughs> so, yeah, awesome pick. I'll definitely uh, end up trying it out. I, I like the, the full screen interface. So you see yeah. the whole camera on the whole screen. It's a really nice interface. So, yeah, I'll definitely give that a shot. And speaking of giving your tech treat a shot, that's actually what my tech treat is. I believe last episode or the week or the episode before that, uh, you actually we uh, had a deal of the week for the uh, Spigen case for the iPhone 5 and 5S. Yeah. And that's exactly what I went and got. And nice. let me tell you what, this is the best case I've ever had for my phone. It is so nice. It's so simple. And as you can see, it is transparent. But the sides here are actually kind of like a, like a, a rubbery slash plastic material. And so it ends up covering the sides of the phone very well. Uh, meanwhile, you can still see the Apple logo through the back. You still have like that whole iPhone 5S look to, or 5, I guess, uh, look to the back of your phone. But yet it's still protected. So actually I have my uh, the 5S here. And well, it's very easy to apply. So you just kind of you know throw it in there. And that's it. I mean, it's in place. And yeah. uh, it looks really nice, especially because I have the Space Gray phone. Uh, I got the gray case. So then the instead of the edges being, uh, you know, having that, kind of like black trim around the edges now we have like a gray trim instead and it really i have, I think brings out the look a lot better and uh, overall it's just a really nice design uh here's you know on the bottom some of the uh like the io options the way you access them uh the camera is not focusing entirely well but there is a nice little cutoff for the lightning and the headphone jack uh your power buttons here uh um, power button up there is covered completely very easy to push <coughs> down uh, same thing with the volume buttons. It's the same kind of a cover. There's actually not a cutout. Uh, you know, that actually covers the button, so it, it kind of helps. You know, stuff like dust you know, keeps that out of there. Overall, just a really nice case. And uh, you can find these on eBay or Amazon, right from Spigen. And I think they're like anywhere from eight to ten bucks. Uh, they have like four different colors. They have a black, a gray, 
a brown, and I think there's one more. So if you have, say, for example, you have like the gold uh, 5S, the brown looks really nice with that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I that mean, other, they have that a picture other of it. Color, the other color, Bob, was actually a metal slate they have. That one's going to be okay. a little more expensive, though. Um, matter of fact, Terrell, actually, I'm glad you said that because Terrell just ordered me. <laughs> A case. It's another one. And what's funny is I actually have I can I'll show you kind of a comparison over the cases that we had. I'm sorry, I know I'm in right in the camera's view right now. <laughs> but these were the cases that we had. And you can kind of tell I like the transparent ones. And, and I know it doesn't seem like it's transparent, but when the phone's actually backed up into it, you can actually see the apple through it. Now here's a speaking case. Yeah. Night yeah, and day it's like glass. And this is the <laughs> space gray one. And yeah, it's really, really nice. I love it. You know, as Bob said, it goes on without a hitch. Uh, one thing, one of the feature, one of the features I really like about it is the power button and the yeah, um, nice. the volume buttons. Now you do have your actual your switch for your of uh, um, vibrator rocker. You know, up and down that is cut out. And um, it, I like this case so so much that if I can find out where I put it anyway. Anyway, I had the new one. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. <laughs> I was like, someone has stolen it. So here it is. Here's my new one. It's not even open yet. And this is the I got the black version uh, because I had the space gray currently. So I got this one, brand new, never never been open, and I'm just having this lit, wait waiting around for this thing to get scuffed up and tore up just so I can slide right into the new one. And this is this particular one's called an ultra hybrid um, case for the iPhone 5 slash 5S. And right there it says, you know, what color it is. And it comes right from them and is very nice. And that's why we have these things. Guys, I'm not going to recommend anything that I won't try myself. Dead serious. And that's part of the whole tech treats. If it's a tech treat, it's because we, we like it. Use it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to recommend anything like, yeah, I would never use that. But oh, well, on to the next show. So, but yeah, um, but thanks, Bob, for that. You know, your tech treat. Oh, thank that, you, sir. <laughs> it's awesome. I love it. And, you know, yeah, I'm kind of glad that we, we got it. It's funny how all of us, you know, yourself, myself, <laughs> and Terrell included, all have the same case <laughs> and on our phones. Yep. And we. And it's funny because all three of us all have unibody white MacBooks, too. You know, uh, Bob <laughs> has the newer one, though. He is he is a 2010, but both of mine and Terrell's are both 2009. So, um, but it, it's, it's really cool that, you know, this company made something so simple so well. And guys, this thing is very well put together as well. Don't, yeah, you know, it's not, awesome. it doesn't, it doesn't even feel cheap. You know, I've had plenty of cases. Those other cases up there, they feel cheap. These do not feel cheap. And they actually do pr protect the phone with like, you know, it makes sure your screens are recessed and everything, you know, so even if it falls on its face, it's going to fall on the outer uh, ring here. And you know, you guys probably look at it like, oh, that doesn't look that like that much uh, protection. But actually, in these cases, they have what's called an air cushion technology. There's an extra space on the corners here that absorbs, like shock absorbs when it actually falls on the corners. Because I've seen people actually damage their phones with their cases on it. And it just hit the corner and they took it off like everything's fine. And they go, oh, the corner, you know, and that's something that they have really strived to protect your phone and make it look well. Because I love being able to have the transparent back on this. And, you know, now that this this case is starting to get a little scuffed up and it's because of my laziness and uses of where I'm just putting my phone sometimes, um, it still was enough for me to buy another case by the same company. So, you know, definitely not a cheap case, but, you know, not cheap as far as quality and material, but cheap in price uh, for what you could pay for like an outer box or something like that. Oh, yeah. This is very nice. And then it adds literally zero bulk. I mean, literally just the bare minimum bulk at all to your phone. I hate when I have a case and it makes my whole phone feel like it's clunky, like I'm right. carrying around, you know, you know, you know, hello, how are you? Who is this? Is this Bob? Yeah, tell me, tell me what's going on. So I don't want to feel like I have just this gigantic phone book or something in my hand. I've seen people use their Otter Box. I've tried, I tried honestly to use an Otter Box back when I had right. an iPhone 4 and a 4S. It was horrible. I hated it. it. Even with the clip and everything, you know, I felt like I had a battery pack or something or I had a catheter and that was my little pee bag or something. It was ridiculous. So, um, definitely, speaking, you know, cases, check them out. Speaking.com, eBay, Amazon, anywhere. Find them. Ultra hybrid case. Um, this particular one, you can find it. Yeah, the uh, Speaking there. SGP. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, it, uh, and I make sure it has the, the logo. Now. There are a lot of yes, fakes out yes. there. Make yes. sure Speaking. that it has the little, it's like a four dot logo 
it's kind of hard to see. I don't know if my camera's going to focus in on it, but yeah, it's right really here, hard to pick up. yeah, um, probably better off just showing this. But if it doesn't have that logo on it, it is a fake. You know, and there's a lot of them out there because they have sold a tremendous amount of these. So yep. check them out, guys. If you guys have uh, uh, phone cases that you're just not quite sure about, I will highly, highly recommend it. And matter of fact, if you don't like it, I will buy you the whole entire season of Hannah Montana sent to yes. your house. <laughs> <laughs> so That's very more generous, likely sir. you will like it because I'm sure no one wants it. <laughs> So, really nice quick, uh, just uh, one thing I don't like about it, uh, the bottom here, that because of like the layout here, if you do have a 30-pin to a lightning adapter, it won't fit quite right. I actually have that. I have an older clock radio for that my iPod, uh, used, my 4S used to go on there, my iPhone, but um, now it doesn't work because I have to have that 30-pin to lightning adapter, so it doesn't quite fit. That's the only thing I don't yeah. like about it, but Make I have workarounds sure. for that. It's worth it. Yeah, see, he has an actual dock, and it fits. The dock, it fits, but here's the thing. It loses connection. Like sometimes it's like it's not enough yeah. yep. in, and so you sometimes have to fidget with it or just have to take it out of the case. And you're like, eh. So that's probably the only thing. If it was maybe shaved down just in between here, just a hair, just a yeah. hair it would be perfect, and it wouldn't take any yep. wave or anything away from the protection of it. But if it was just shaved down just a bit, that would be perfect. You know, so because yep. you know. I mean, it's nice. I mean, other other than that, that's that's literally the only thing I could complain about about this case. Yeah, but yeah, that, right. I still give it like a ninety-eight out of a hundred. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's oh. definitely a very nice case. So definitely be sure to check it out. But there you guys go. There's our tech treats, and there's episode seventeen of Tech Cabot Weekly. Thank you guys very much for joining in. Uh, those of you guys in the chat room, a couple here, uh, Stefan. Uh, we have Tech Junkies Anonymous. Go ahead, uh, like him, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> K Mr. Kai Monster, uh, tons of other people here in the chat. Uh, about 20 live viewers are uh, consistent today. That, that number uh, tends to be growing a little bit, so thank you guys for taking the time to stop out. I uh, really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Dante, for joining me. Uh, be sure to check out uh, check out one place for Apple and one place for tech during the week. Uh, also, be sure to check out Roach Technology. And also, I've uh, recently just brought back the Roach Technology forums. They were actually down a while, not accepting users because of these crazy spam attacks. But I finally, you know, got some time to do some research about spam prevention and stuff. So the forum is now active. You're free to register. So go ahead and check out the Roach Technology forums and um, be sure to you know. Let us, uh, let us know what you're up to on Twitter uh, because we'll let you know what we're up to on Twitter. Which, by the way, your Twitter, Twitter handle is? My Twitter handle is at KC Nightmare. And it's not spelled any funky way. Capital K-C-N-I-G-H-T-M-A-R-E. Then also shout out to our producer, Terrell Clark. And you can find him at 1P for Terrell. And also, of course, Bob, CPU Kid Roach, you can find him there. And also, if you haven't done so already, like and subscribe to this channel. And you can find us here Absolutely. at Tech Habit Weekly. Uh, we'll try to bring you this uh, this podcast every week. But, of course, like uh, Bob has said before, life does happen. Sorry for the long show. We almost like – compact two shows into <laughs> one um and we do appreciate you guys that are uh tuning in that are it's very late or very early in the morning um where you are and we do appreciate your guys's uh fan base and your dedication and that's why we're here to bring you guys this product uh as much as we can every week so Absolutely. thank you so much for everybody for joining see you next time yep. have a good week